part of my Be the Church series, declare him king. The first three messages in this series dealt with being the church, it's exploring the internal things that happen in us that will cause us to be on the outward realm, the church, being the church, not just going to church, but being the church. First one was seeing his glory. We cannot be saved, we cannot move ahead, we can go nowhere with God until we see his glory. In fact, we realize who he is, his character, his beauty, his power, who God is. We have to see that first. And then when we see that, the second part of that we talked about was his love is just poured out to us. He loves us just as much as he loved Jesus. That's what the most amazing thing is. Knowing his love. And then the third thing we talked about was, and then from, from seeing his glory and receiving his love, we begin to express an attitude of worship. Where we simply become worshipers. In everything we say, in everything we do, not just a slow song on Sunday morning, but everything in our lives becomes an act of worship to him. So we're humbled when we see his glory, like Isaiah was. We're humbled. We see his beauty, his majesty, his power. We're consecrated when we're born again and we become forgiven people. We are totally forgiven. We're consecrated unto God and then his love purifies us and we present our entire beings to him as worshipers. We worship in spirit and in truth. We're ready to fulfill the mission of the church. And what's the mission of the church? It's to make disciples. We preach the word with our lives. We preach it not with our mouths as much as we preach it with our lives. What does your life look like? Does your life look like a message from God? Make disciples. It's our mission. And the entire process of, of becoming and being <clears throat> all the church should be, <clears throat> all that God intended the church to be, is a progressive revelation. We understand more as we, as we move ahead in Him, as we seek Him, as we read His Word, as we pray, as we get together in groups like this. We, we gradually we grow and we learn. And we get more and more insight into who God is and what His, pro his process of changing us is. We commit ourselves to knowing Christ more completely. Our spiritual growth in, a, in this whole process determines how effective we're going to be as a church. Not River of Life Church, but as the church. All believers everywhere will only be as effective as how, how far they are growing in their faith. Everybody's at different levels, I understand that. But we all should be on the same path. All the same path. <clears throat> And so now after, after seeing this part of it, the, the, the uh, glory of God and his love poured out on us and becoming worshipers, then we begin to see how this begins to, to translate into the, into the real world that we live in. Uh, our internal spiritual devotion to Christ then becomes an outward expression of him. And the Bible says that we're ambassadors for Christ. And an ambassador of a country declares their leader as king. When, our, when ambassadors from our country go to another country, we are declaring that our president is our leader. When the, an ambassador from another country goes, I'm representing that person, I'm representing that leader, that king, that president, that, that whoever it might be. That's who I represent as, a, as an ambassador. So we are ambassadors for Christ, that's what the Bible says. And we declare him to be king. He is my king. I'm a member now, a citizen of his kingdom, not of the kingdoms of this world. That's my primary citizenship. He's the king of the kingdom of God. The apostle John had a revelation of Jesus Christ. In verse 19, of chapter 19 and verse 11, he had a vision of the glory of God and many other visions during this time. And in this particular part of his vision, he said, I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. This rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. 
a name was written on him that no one understood except himself. <clears throat> he wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. Who are we seeing here? Jesus. We're seeing Jesus Christ at the, in the end times, at the end of time. And it goes on. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest pure white linen. Who's that? <clears throat> it's us, the church. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. What is that sharp sword? It's the word of God. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe and on his thigh was written this title, King of all kings, Lord of all lords. This is the end of time as we know it, and the beginning of the eternal kingdom of God for all of those who are believers. So the kings and the kingdoms of the earth are all going to pass away, every single one of them. But the kingdom of God and its king are eternal. Jesus told Pontius Pilate when he was on trial, Pontius Pilate asked him, are you a king? And Jesus said, Yes, I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. Let me say that again. Jesus said, yes, I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. When we're born again, the Bible says that we are a new creation. The church is made up of people who are new creations and citizens of the kingdom of God. The church is actually a new humanity, a new race of people in which there is no Jew, no Gentile, no male, no female, no slave, no free, no racial or cultural distinctions at all in the kingdom of God. We are all part of that kingdom. Paul mentions three groups of people in 1 Corinthians 10. He mentions the Jews, the Greeks, or all non-Jews, the Jews and all non-Jews, he calls them the Greeks or the Gentiles, and the Church of God. Three groups. In, uh, in uh, the second and third centuries, Christians called themselves the new race. They called themselves the third race. And in Christ, God launched a new order, a new kingdom that is completely separate from the world system. It's a spiritual kingdom, completely separate from the system of the world. In 2 Corinthians 6. Now this is... What I'm going to share with you today is, is really hard for us to grasp because we don't see ourselves this way quite often. But here's what it says in, in 2 Corinthians 6. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? It's pretty clear in this passage that there's only two possibilities for our spiritual life. One is with Christ and one was without Christ. One is with him and the other is with the devil, with the world. There's only, there's only two. And, and, and Paul is exhorting people. He said, don't, don't connect with those people who are not part of your life, your spiritual life. He said, don't do it. And he goes on, he says, then what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And as God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. We are separated unto God. And therefore, finally in this passage, it says, come out from among them, or come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things. And I will welcome you, and I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now to be careful, now we don't think we're supposed to become hermits living in cages, in caves. That's not what it's saying here. It says there's a spiritual power in the world that you don't want to be a part of. 
It's the devil's kingdom. You don't want to be a part of that. And, but if you join yourself to someone who is part of that, then you are diluting yourself in your spiritual life. There's a danger there to you. Bad company does what? Corrupts, Corrupts good morals. That's what the Bible says. We, if we connect with people who are ungodly, uh, they will have an ungodly influence on us no matter how strong we think we are. So we have to be very, very careful. So as we declare Jesus Christ to be king, we declare that we are citizens of his kingdom. Totally separate from the world, from the world system. We're then able to recognize the temptations and the, and the try to sidetrack us from being everything God wants us to be. Now the devil is the ruler of the world system. He's the ruler of the world system, period. God is the ruler of the kingdom of God. And we as believers are part of the kingdom of God. We are not part of the world system. That's, again, this is a spiritual position. It's a supernatural position. The devil is, a, is, a, is, is the leader of the rule, world system and he uses it, he uses the world to stir up our fleshly desires. Note the progression. We have the devil, the world, and the flesh. Right here. We've got all, of our, all three of our main enemies right here. The devil has the, has the world system in his grasp, the, uh, and he uses that world system to stir up our flesh, cause us to, to, to act sinfully. Galatians 5, verse 16 says, Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your flesh craves. How many of you can relate to this? I mean, Wow. This world tempts us to get involved in all kinds of stuff that's ungodly, that, that will cause destruction to us, cause trouble for us. I have a friend who says, this, he, every time I see him, he says, now remember, Tom, good behavior, good results. Bad behavior, bad results. That's just the way it works. That's, that's the system. So let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your flesh craves. These two forces, the flesh and the spirit, are constantly fighting each other for a believer. Your flesh is fighting the spirit, the spirit's fighting the flesh, and, and then it says, but if you're directed by the spirit, you're not obligation under obligation to the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments and all the law of Moses. You're not under obligation to them. The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments and all the other 603 laws of Moses, make demands on our flesh and on our behavior. It is the worldly system or the worldly perspective. After we're born again by grace, through faith, the Holy Spirit, not the law, but the Holy Spirit then guides our lives and that is the kingdom of God. And that kingdom gives us the power we need to overcome all of these temptations that we struggle with. If we're struggling with temptation, the Bible is pretty clear, then you're not being led by the Spirit of God. That's, you need to be focusing more on the Spirit of God and less on behavior issues. And we're always going to struggle against temptations unless we declare Christ as King in our lives. He is the King. I am a citizen of the Kingdom of Heaven. He has overcome the world. And since I am in Him and He is in me, I have the power to overcome the world. I'm going to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God and not as a citizen of the world. It's hard for us to see this. I, don't, I'm, 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 I have really begun to get a revelation of what God is talking about. I'm trying to communicate it to you, not in, a, not in a, any kind of a mean or, or angry way, but this is what God says. So clear. If we, and I want us to be the church. We can't be the church if we're worldly. I mean, it's just the way it is. And, and boy, I'll tell you what, all kinds of stuff come, come through our minds. Like, what about this? What about that? What about this? Colossians chapter 2. You have what? There we go. You have what? Die with Christ. Can a dead man be tempted? No. No. You died with Christ. And he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. You're free. That's something we need to believe. 
We can, ask, we can say, yeah, I see that, but we need to believe it. And then he says, so why do you keep on following the rules of the world? Such as don't handle this, don't taste that, don't touch this. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate and we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desire. What he's saying, the outside rules and laws and regulations do nothing to help us overcome our natural fleshly desire. They can't help. The only thing that can help is the Spirit of God, being led by the Spirit of God. Now, what the church does, and I've got a lot of experience with the church in several different perspectives. What I've seen, the church copies the methods that the world uses to control people's behavior. <clears throat> Let me say that again. The church copies the methods of the world to control people's behavior by laying down laws and rules and regulations. You must do this. You must not do that. If you want to be part of us, this is what you have to believe. If you don't believe this, then go somewhere else. Blah, blah, blah. All, all this stuff goes on and it even goes on in the church. They don't work. I'm a living example that it doesn't work <laughs> to control my behavior. All those rules don't do a thing. Now, when, now listen, when we see ourselves as holy, when we see ourselves as holy, because that's what God says we are, then things change. The word holy has nothing to do with the way we talk or the way we dress or where we go to the church meetings. It has nothing to do with those things. It simply means that as a holy person, I am separated from the world unto God. It's all holy mean. We've taken, we've taken the holiness movement way too far. <coughs> God says, when you're born again, you are separated unto God. You belong to Him now. Unto Him. So, so um, we're separated from this world system unto God, and we're separated from sin. As, as a holy person, we're separated. The Greek word uh, that's, that's translated church is the word ekklesia. And that simply means called out ones, called out, separated, called out of the world. That's what, what, that's what we are, separated ones. And over and over the Bible says that, that we, the church, are spiritually free. We are separated from the world. We become citizens under a new king and the kingdom of God. The Jews, again, as I said before, only identified two groups. The Jews did. Jews and Gentiles. Jews and non-Jews. Here's what Paul said about these two groups under Christ. This is powerful stuff. Ephesians chapter 2, he said, Jesus' purpose was to create in himself, in himself, one new humanity. A whole new race. A whole new... A uh, group of people who are not like anything that has ever existed before. A new humanity out of the two, both Jews and Gentiles. In other words, all people. Jews and non-Jews. Thus making peace and in one body. One body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. By which he put to death their hostility. He took away the hostility that was between Jews and Gentiles. And in Christ, once they receive Christ, there's no longer a Jew, there's no longer a Gentile. We are believers, we're Christians, we're one in Christ. The body, the church, the body of Christ. And then verse 19 talks about them being members of God's household. It's, it's a household, it's a place apart from the world. Ephesians 3 and 4 uh, Paul talks about the church being one body again, in perfect unity. All through, all through the New Testament, the church is one body. So Jesus speaks of the Father drawing people to Him to be saved. What God does, He draws us out of the world to be saved. Out of the world system and into His household, His body, His humanity, His kingdom. That's where we are now as believers. So Paul speaks of himself as being separated to the gospel of God. He said, that's my job now. That's my calling to, to preach the gospel of grace. And all through scripture, again, 
we find that God intends his people to be separated from the world system. To be his people under his leadership alone. To repeat 2 Corinthians 6, we did this before. What union can there be between God's temple and idols? We are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. This is a spiritual separation. It's a supernatural separation. That's what he wants us to be. Have a different outlook. We don't have the same values as the world. Those who don't, have, don't talk the same way as the world. Now our enemy, now listen, this is, this is, I'm getting to the main point. That was introduction. <laughs> the strategy of our enemy. The Bible tells us that we are not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of his strategy. We can see it as the church. What he wants to do is to keep the church in bondage to rules and laws that no one can keep. He wants the church to stay under the, under the legalism that, was, that existed in the Old Covenant. He wants our salt. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. He wants our salt to be mixed with dirt so it loses its flavor. The dirt of the world, right? He wants our light we're supposed to be the light of the world. He wants our light to be hidden under a bucket. Or within a building. Not out there. Just keep it in the building. We'll be just fine. And if we do that, if our light is hidden under a bucket, as it were, the world cannot find its way to God. Because we're the light. We, he wants unsaved people to look at the church with ridicule and suspicion. Those people are crazy. Those people are just like us. What's so different about them? They're nuts. They, I don't have any clue what they're talking about. That's the way the world looked. That's the way the unsaved people look at the church. If we're not the church the way he wants it to be. And he wants believers, the devil wants believers to be divided. Because he knows if we are united, there is unbelievable power. But he keeps us divided. Wow. The only way the church can accomplish everything God desires is to see itself full of God's glory, full of His great love for all people, full of His, uh, uh, His the Holy Spirit's desire for us to be worship, us to be worshippers, to worship God in spirit and in truth, and to see us as one unified kingdom under God. Doesn't matter what building we meet in, where we meet. We are one kingdom, the church is. All denominational divisions. We're one people. Now, while God wants his church to be separate from the world system, he does not want us to be separate from unsaved people. You hear me? He doesn't want us to be separate from unsaved people in the sense that we need to avoid them at all costs, don't talk to them, don't have anything to do with them. That's not what he's talking about. How, how, the Bible says, how will the unsaved hear if someone doesn't tell them? And it's our job to tell them, but it's not our job to be connected with them, to be united with them. But our job is to be among them and tell them. It's a huge difference. That separation is an internal position, not an external one. Now, except in the being joined together, connected with. Uh, well, I could tell you stories about what goes on when believers get involved with unbelievers in the wrong way. In any, anyway, we're to be in the world, the Bible says, right? We're to be in the world, but not what? Oh. Not of the world. We're to be in it. Because Jesus said, I don't want you to take, he prayed to the Father, I don't want you to take my people out of the world, but protect them while they're in the world. Right? That's what he does. He protects us while we're in it. We need to be the voice of God to this world. So, now I'm going to, do, now I'm going to get a little philosophical with you. Now watch out, because you, you, you're, you, there's a danger you're going to misunderstand me here, okay? Are you with me? Turn on your, your hearer.
some things I see the church doing that supports the enemy's agenda. The mentality of the typical institutional corporate church can be in conflict with the kingdom of God. Let's say a local church decides to build a building. They begin by focusing on what? Building the building. That becomes the focus of the church. And they reduce their emphasis on building the kingdom of God because they're in a building program. After that building program is over, then their objective becomes to do what? Draw people into the building so they can collect enough money to pay the bill. Now that, that sounds crass, but I have seen it over and over and over again. And this conflicts with God's plan for his church. First of all, Jesus' ministry model wasn't to draw people into a building. His ministry model was to go to them. You hear me? He, he, he went to minister to them wherever they were. Out in the countryside, in somebody's house, at the, in the temple courts. Wherever the people were, that's where Jesus went. And that's where he ministered. They crowded on a hillside to listen to him teach. He pushed off in a boat and they stood by the seashore listening to him teach. They, he went into a house and healed people. It was just amazing the way he, he did that. Now in Acts 10 it tells about that in verse 37. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism? And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So following Jesus' model, the early church met in homes. They met outdoors. Again, they met where in the same places that Jesus met with them. And to the unsaved people, these are more attractive locations than formal church buildings. The church building can be a barrier to the unsaved, even when they're invited with someone that they've got a relationship with. It can be a barrier because they, they see that building as being, I don't know what goes on in there. I've heard some weird things about what goes on in there. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, if I walk through the door, a roof would cave in because I'm such a bad person. So the unsaved have got a real reluctance to walk into a church building. You see what I'm saying? Oh, boy, I'm in trouble now. So a, so a church building can be an intimidating to the casual unsaved person, but a home or a neutral position, a, a Starbucks coffee shop, a Dunkin' Donuts, you, you got a ministry at Dunkin' Donuts. Sit there and talk to people, <coughs> open the Bible. It's God's ministry, but you're, you're performing it. He calls you to do stuff like that. That's, that's what we do. That's what the main work of the church is, to be out there among the people. But he said in the Great Commission, he said, Go. Did he, say, did, he, did he say, come to my church building? No, he said, go and, and preach the gospel and make disciples. Go, 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 go. We have to be careful. We have to be careful that we don't get wrapped up in the idea of building an organization, building a large congregation, instead of building the kingdom of God. Now, I've got more to say about that when I get through here, but bear with me. Second, <clears throat> second thing, uh, Jesus' great prayer was, well, for the church was that it would be united as one. That, Jesus prayed for, for the church. He said, said this, uh, John 17. I think I got it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> he prayed to the Father. He said, I have given them the glory you gave me. Given my disciples, the, those believers, I've given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. <clears throat> the only way the world will know that God sent Jesus as Savior 
is if the church is in unity. I mean, the only way they will really know it, really grasp it, the world outside the church, I'm saying. They, they should be able to look at the church and say, wow, those people are really different. They love each other. They take care of each other. They're not fighting among each other. Those people really have a, have a, have a good deal going there. But the church, unfortunately, is, is falling into the devil's pattern of division because people thought they could improve the church by establishing thousands of different Christian denominations. That's not God's plan. I've said this before, I'll say it again. And uh, God never established any denomination. Not one. I was part of a denomination that said, God established our denomination. And I stand and said, He did not. Because God is not into division. He does not divide up people. Boy, I'm getting angry now. I'm not angry. It's just, just, I see that and I just say, wow, what are we doing? His strategy is to divide believers. And, and the church plays right into his hand by establishing all these divisions and by getting an attitude. Well, well, uh, that's a Baptist church. I don't go to a Baptist church. That's the Assembly of God church. They speak in tongues. Oh, my God. There. That's a Catholic church. They got, they got idols all over the place in there. I wouldn't step foot in there. That's the way we act. That's the way we think. Is that my right? Well, and that's ungodly. And I'm guilty of the same thing. I'm guilty of looking at another church that, that seems to be excited and exploding, and I'm getting, you know, thinking, well, really? Really? No. Can I be honest? Being as honest as I can be. Oh. While church buildings can separate the church from unsaved people, denominations have separated saved people from saved people. There's, a, there's, a, there's an ungodly, worldly separation taking place. There's competition, there's jealousy, there's, there's contentions, there's all of that going on. And the unsaved world looks at this and says, Wow, <laughs> you want me to be a part of that mess? <laughs> No thanks. They're just like us. No different. There's Democrats and there's Republicans. You have the same fights going on in the church. Just like that. Back, 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 back. Same thing. So why, why are they different? Now, I am not saying that church buildings are evil. I'm not saying that denominations are evil. I'm saying that we need to open up our eyes and see what's important to God. That's my purpose. Buildings can help, but they can also assist the devil in his plan to separate. Denominations could help, but they split up the church. I just, I haven't got the answer. People are going to shake their heads at me and say, well, well, but look at all the good these churches and denominations have done. Look at all the people who've been saved. And I, and I say this, I say, it's not up to me to judge the effectiveness of another ministry. We tend to do it. I tend to do it from time to time. I've got to be really careful of that. It's not up to me to, to criticize or, or to come against anybody else's idea of what ministry is for them. It's only up to me to answer my calling under my king for his church and encourage others to see before they act. The Bible says that following his plan, following Jesus' plan for the early church, turned the world upside down. I mean, it, it, it disrupted the whole Roman government, it disrupted cities and it disrupted communities and it just was it was a disruption. And it turned the world upside down and thousands and thousands and thousands of people were saved. Three thousand were saved the first message that was preached under the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not against stuff. I just gonna say we need to be cautious 
as a church. Let's do things God's way. You know? I haven't got the answer. God has the answer. It's his, it's his church. And I'm, I'm just trying to follow his leadership. So, so as we move ahead as a church body, this, this, this group is growing. More new people coming all the time. And it's exciting to see people are hungry for the word of God. And we have to be careful that we don't get into any of the worldly mindsets of the church. You still love me? Yeah. You have to say yes to me. As God said, you've got to love everybody. So we declare him as king. I, I declare him as king over my life. I declare him as king over my life. I declare him as king over this church. As far as any influence I may have, I'm going to share what God has shown me. And I know there's a lot of plans and a lot of ideas and people have things that they like to do and, and put together for the church and I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight against. I'm going to fight for God and His, and His will. So we declare Him King and we, we need to declare ourselves as citizens of the kingdom of God. His kingdom is in the world, but not of it. Totally separate kingdom. We are... As human beings, we are in the world, but we're not of it. We're a separate humanity. And we are here to show the world what God looks like. Show the world what Jesus looks like. Show the world how much God loves people. All people. Loves them all. Yeah, even that guy, even that guy. Yes, all of them. As far as God's concerned, every person on earth has redemptive value. He's interested in having them come to him. No matter what they've done, no matter who they are, no matter what we think of them. God says, until they die, I'm going to try to reach them. Because I love them. I don't agree with a lot of the stuff they do. But my love is not based on behavior. My love is based on who I am. That's what God says. That's good. God says, my love's not based on behavior. My love's based on who I am. I am love, says God. I am love, so I can do nothing but love. So I ask you today, do you know him? Have you ever received him as your Savior? The invitation is for every single person on the face of the earth, no matter what. They, who, never, who they are or what they've done. The invitation is there. Do you know him? If you don't know him, you're lost. You may not agree with that, but it's Bible. And I've learned it was true. Do you know him? And the way you know him is you simply say, I believe. I really believe, Lord, that you came to save me personally. And I receive you as my Savior. And I know you're going to forgive me of all my sin. I know you're going to welcome me into the household of God. I know you're going to make me part of this new humanity. I know you're going to do that because I believe and I receive you. No pastor can save you. No organization, no church can save you. Only Jesus. And all I can do is let you know it's for you. It's for you. Some, some people think they're saved, but then suddenly they realize, you know, I'm not so sure. And you can be sure. Well, I want you today to just take a moment right now. Is he king in your life? Is he king? Have you declared him your king? That's my king. It's a transaction between you and God. Not between you and any church or any human beings. Transaction too. And it takes place the moment you say, I really do believe. That's all, that's the only requirement. 
And I said a lot of things today that may jar some of our thoughts about what the church is and what the church should be and the things the church should have and how the church should operate. I, I may have disrupted some of your thinking, but I just, just ask you this. Consider it. Consider it. As we move ahead in the church body here in Barefoot Bay, I want us to be God's people. I don't want to be a worldly church. There's a lot of those. Enough of those now. I want to be God's church. I want to be a kingdom church. A kingdom body. And I'm going to continue this series. And next week I'm going to talk about what it means, what it really means to be separated from the world. I'm going to give you some examples that I've struggled with. And some of you struggled with. We need to get a handle on this. Some of us can be real worldly. And if we're going to be an example of this world as God has called us to be, if we're going to be a, a light in the darkness, if we're going to be a salt in a world that has no real flavor to it, we need to really be sold out. And that's why so many people left Jesus, you know that, because he preached that that's what you had to do. Total devotion to him. Total devotion. A lot of them said, we can't handle that. We're going to go, we're going to go someplace else where it's easier. Well, it may be easier, but it may not be productive. Well, let me bless you before we go up to me. Father, I pray that every person here will be filled with the glory of your spirit. That they would walk uprightly in the Spirit and receive the victory as you've given them over the flesh and the world and all the temptations. May we all be true ambassadors for Jesus Christ wherever we go. Let us take to heart, Lord, as you said we should go into the world and let people know about the love of God and the opportunity to have a relationship with them. Let's just help us to be people who will simply go. And then when we come back together and meet together, we'll be able to testify and we'll be able to rejoice and get excited about the things that you're doing out there. And Lord, I pray you'll continue to give me wisdom in the leadership position that I have to preach the truth and to be, I want to be the kind of person you want me to be, Lord. I want every person here to be the kind of person you want them to be in the spirit and then it comes out in the natural, so church, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you each day, every day, with mercy, love, and grace. And give you, as I often say, something the world can't give, give you peace. Shalom, the peace of God that passes all understanding. Amen. Amen. Amen.